Howdy. I'm Ray Pilgrim. Well, it's the middle of May. I did think it would be a nice sunny day, but instead it's drizzling, it's raining. It looks like crap outside. Oh, come back over here. Oh, you come over here. There. And I'm sitting here cogitating, thinking, and and my sinuses are going crazy because of the changing weather. But um, <clears throat> I pulled out this. This is an 1863 Pocket Police. It's the first really good compact uh, revolver that uh, Colt ever made. Matter of fact, it's the last one Colt made because uh, he died while they were still developing this. Basically, I know he had gout and some other disease issues, but he basically worked himself to death. I mean, he just he he lived in the factory most of the time, and this was his last accomplishment as the head of Colt. Well, that made me think of something. Everybody walks around. By the way, this this holster came with it. It's a really neat holster. It's uh, it's got a, a good built loop on the back, extra loops on top, and you can lash it to your leg with these uh, extra. Uh, leather straps down here. So, uh, you know, you walk down the street, you got that on your hip, and you, know, you're, you feel pretty well confident that you're uh, well strapped. <laughs> well, and that's the thing. In the 19th century, a fellow would walk down the street with one of these, or something like it. Usually, you know, it could be anything from a, a, a dragoon down to, down to this, but it would be some kind of revolver. Until 1873, when you get uh, metallic cartridge ones. But uh, this is Captain Ball. Anyway, but the other thing you don't have anybody walking down the street would be a wallet. You know, you walk down the street and there's a cop standing there saying, You got some ID? You to prove who you are? Well, around 1863, when this came out, unless you're in the army, then you don't, the only thing you'd have in your pocket if you're in the army was probably a pay voucher. The pay voucher was, uh, and usually it was in a script back then, especially in the Confederacy. And that just meant uh, something to show that, you know, you, uh, Trooper Smith just was paid his, uh, his monthly $7. I mean, they didn't pay much. But uh, I've, I've got a, a diary from a, a Civil War uh, relative of mine. And uh, most of the diaries consisted of marched to so-and-so, got sick, laid up in camp, sick. Then we marched to new place, got sick. <laughs> no, it was a, a record of being ill and being on marches. <clears throat> no battles. And, and I guess he was lucky in that he survived and he didn't have to go through a battle, but uh, at least from the writings in his diary. Uh, he did mark down when Lincoln was assassinated, which is kind of interesting. It, his name was Peck, and he was from uh, Ohio, so uh, he was a he was a northern troop. Got another side of the family that came from the Confederate side, so uh, family gatherings. You got to remember which family you're with before you start opening your mouth in Thanksgiving. You know. <laughs> but anyway, the thing is, is that a fellow would not carry his ID. The only time a man would ever carry any kind of ID is if he was a, well, say a doctor or some other professional. Then he, he'd have his license or something to prove that he was a, an MD or a dentist. I mean, Doc Holliday had one. Uh, to prove that he has the uh, credentials. But uh, if you're just, you know, a farm laborer or a farmer or a, a, a miller or the fellow who runs the general store, you don't, you don't carry around any ID. But you usually carried around a, a weapon of some kind, especially in the early days of the Old West. You had Indian troubles and wild animals and all kinds of other issues that you got to deal with. And uh, so this was your ID back then. Today, I got to have an ID to carry one of these. We have, got, we have come so far, not, you know, I don't know, just, just some reflections and ruminations you know, watching the news and thinking about things like this and thinking you know, nowadays you've got to basically carry your DNA uh, with you just to, to show who you are. 
you know, and if you're a, a citizen or a, a you're, you're, you're not a ne'er-do-well, and if you're a ne'er-do-well, you've got to sh carry a piece of ID that says you're a ne'er-do-well so that they know, I guess. I don't know, I, you know, in the days of Daniel Boone, uh, the sound, the, he, he said that if you can hear the sound of your neighbor's axe, it's time to move to the next valley. And I wish we were still like that. I wish we were still had a wide open frontier and a man could just disappear into it and, uh, and just start over and start a new life. You know, that, a lot of people did that. A lot of narrative wells did that, but a lot of really successful people did that. And it, call, it, it caused us to, to blaze a new nation because of that. You know, somebody who just wanted to, to go off to uh, the badlands of New Mexico or the, uh, the, the silver fields of Colorado or, or gold in, in California. You know. Anyway, by the way, I was also reading a book. This is the, my latest uh, foray into to reading. I, I read a lot. This is called 20 Years Before the Mast. And it's by a fellow who started out as a, uh, a ship's boy uh, in uh, the 1830s, 1840s or thereabouts in America. And uh, they were doing a, a, a survey, a scientific survey of the Pacific, just for um, giggles, I guess, for the, uh, uh, the people in D.C., Washington City, as it was called then. And uh, it, show, it talks about them going through Fiji and... Uh, uh, all of the other South Sea Isles, uh, landing in uh, uh, New Zealand and Australia, and going across and around Antarctica uh, and expl exploring that. Uh, th then they came back, and uh, uh, I forget the captain's name of this, but uh, he's known in history as the fellow who almost got us directly into a war with England because he uh, had... Uh, uh, illegally basically uh, uh, taken on board and captured off of a British warship two diplomats from the, the Confederacy and that caused an international scandal. I, I forget his name and I forget their names but that's just one of those Civil War things. You know, contemporary with this, <laughs> this this was usually used by the, the uh, oh, I gotta tighten that screw down it's a little loose. Huh. Make a note of that. Anyway, uh, this was used by uh, the police department in New York City, among others, and it was called the Pocket Police for that reason. But uh, it's a nice pistol. I, I like this. Of all my uh, uh, various black powder guns, I think this is the most elegant one. And it's it's a 36, and it shoots well. It's a five shot, and it shoots well. Uh, it's a it's a nice uh, pistol. I put some slick shot uh, nipples on it to make up for uh, what was on it. Uh, I think this is a, I don't remember, is this, it must be a Pieta, because it doesn't have the, the paragraph under the, uh, honestly, I don't know why this thing keeps stopping on me. Uh, this is an Uberti. Uh, the Ubertis, the way you can tell the difference is the Ubertis will put their markings underneath the loading rod right here. Uh, Pieta puts it on the sides here. And we'll put black powder only on it somewhere, you know, to uh, tell you about it. Uh, but uh, it's a, this one's really well done, in my opinion. It's got the fluted cylinders, it's got the color case hardening, and it has the, the more elegant uh, 1860 army looking uh, barrel assembly on it. So it's a really slick looking pistol, I think. And with this holster, like I said, I'd, I'd feel very well strapped with that. <laughs> anyway, just something I've been uh, 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 thinking about today. You know, my, my 19th century identification card, as it were. You know, may I see your papers, please? <laughs> Happy trails.